Hello, everybody. Bo Billington here with The Free Agent. Um, I've got Mike Wittenstein here, founder of Story Miners. Thanks so much for joining, Mike. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Bo. First time on the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And so I've gone over a myriad of topics and storytelling is actually one I, I find the most fascinating. Uh, in, in fact, you know, I've really tried to kind of uh, apply, uh, I don't want to say the art, but storytelling in my day to day and, uh, you know, surrounding my business. And I've been in business for four and a half years. And I really think that I could have fast tracked my success had I've understood storytelling at the onset of starting a business. Right. You know, you um, know what? Let, let me jump in real quick. What, what the secret to storytelling is, is understanding how your listeners brain works. Because when you're telling a story, no matter what the purpose, you're actually getting their neurons and their brain chemistry to fire. Some people do that with nefarious means in mind. Sure. Others do it to be very helpful. Some relate history. Some talk about the future. But that, that comfort that you're talking about from storytelling and fast tracking means yes. you are locked and wired in to the needs of the people that you're talking to. So it starts way before you start talking. Keep going. I, I, I totally agree. That's, that's a great point. And you brought up something interesting as well. I think when most folks talk about storytelling, it's always in the past, but you've got a little bit of a different take on storytelling. And sometimes, you know, you you're, yeah. you're also have the future in mind more so than anything. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you view storytelling a little bit different than maybe most? Absolutely. Um, you know, we're all brought up as, as small children sitting on somebody's knee and hearing a story, whether it's Santa Claus or an uncle, or you're just kind of reading a book on your own under a blanket with a flashlight. By the way, did you notice what I just did? I made you feel your own memories from the past as I was talking. That's an example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a story yeah. because it's not me telling you words. It's me creating an experience for you to have so that you can think and you can make your own decisions going forward. So we named the company Story Miners 20 years ago, the idea being that inside every brand and every leader, there's already a story. It's just like dying to get out. And we're pretty good at isolating what that is and sharing it in a way that other people can relate to it. But you're right. A lot of people tell stories about the past. And it's kind of true because most stories have already happened. When you watch the news, it's got the word new in it, but it's really about the past, even if it was four or five hours ago. Absolutely. One of the things that we found that's so fascinating, and I didn't know this until a few years ago, um, is that the most powerful stories you can tell in business are about where things are headed. Because everybody wants to know how to live better, how to decide better, how to run their business. What decision should I make today? So we're all constantly evaluating all these different options for the way the future can work. So if you're a good storyteller, not only can you get people like woken up, if you will, and in the moment, you know, thinking and actively participating in the dialogue that you're co-creating with them, but you can give them a clear picture of what their future in your future plans looks like. And that's what people want to know. Everything else is just noise. So essentially the goal then is to articulate um, some, some successful outcome for your prospect or customer. Is that essentially when speaking about the future and creating a story? You know, about- that's, that's the kind of stuff that goes into a business plan, Bo. We okay. will achieve this outcome. We will do these numbers. This is our percentage improvement. And we're going to have these new products and services. Those are easy. I think, you know, some of the leaders of businesses these days have have kind of rested too long on this notion of all they have to do is declare the targets right. and then give the work to other people to do. I don't think that's the way it works anymore. I think the way it works is we're all in a new boat together. And that new boat is we have to invent the future. Nobody is working the way they did two years ago. True. Maybe a cobbler. Maybe yeah. the guy that spreads well, they're not even because people aren't going to work anymore. So, so you know, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's all different for everybody. So, we all have to be creating new capabilities in our businesses so that we can meet clients' new needs because they don't need us to do what we used to do. They need us to do things that they need. And a lot of times we haven't done them yet. So, coming back to you know what a business does and talking about just declaring the outcomes, it's more than that. It's using a story to more comfortably describe the way the business is going to work going forward. And that's where people are nervous. A lot of employees, a lot of top managers, even owners, they don't know 
what's going to happen and how to go, but they've got all these concerns about you. I've got to look good and I've got to do the right thing. And I still have to make a lot of money. And it's, it's tough. It's really hard to do. It, it just puts so much pressure on everybody that it, it feels almost impossible. So a lot of folks resort to telling stories as in lies or half truths, or they make promises with their brand that their business can't deliver. I'm not a big fan of that. So what we discovered a few years ago was that if you think through the way your business has to work to deliver more value for your clients and your employees and still deliver on the bottom line, you craft that as an experience. You can do it right here. Sometimes you can write it down on some paper or use some cool journey mapping software, but you have to get the experience of the future right. And then you tell the story about your customer or your employee or your partner or whomever you're talking to in that new experience. And all of a sudden, using those same tools as, you know, under the sheets with a flashlight, you know, you right. make them realize that these things are real, they'll bring their imagination and their creativity and their willingness to work with you to make that real because it's appealing to them. And they see that they've got place, they've got purpose and so on. That's what future story does that traditional storytelling and old fashioned ways of managing, you know, from the past extrapolating into the future. That's what they do. And we're done. That was all I wanted to say today. Yeah, no, no, that's fantastic. It's <laughs> the easiest interview I've had. Um, but, but I think that's a good segue to, to kind of dig a little bit deeper. And uh, how, how does one go about actually formulating a good story? What are the components? You know, where do you even start, right? Because a lot of people aren't right. going to have maybe the, the funds to, to hire somebody like yourself, or they're going to give it an initial crack themselves, right? So, sure. so what are, you know, what, what are the best right, let me ask you a couple of questions. Let's make the scenario nice and tight. So um, who is the story for? by and who is it for and what's the situation just make something up and we'll work with it sure let's just think it's about like improv without the humor okay yeah yeah no of course so let's think about maybe an independent consultant that left that okay. left corporate america um you know they're an executive level um and they've they've got a lot of skill sets that they know they can you know utilize in the marketplace um, but they're not exactly sure of the kind of how to formulate the strategy and the brand and ultimately get their story into the market on how they could provide, you know, how they could delight customers. Okay. All right. Gotcha. All right. So bear with me for a second, because this might take about three minutes to do and, and feel free to interject questions as I go along. <clears throat> um, traditionally, what people have been taught to do by the outplacement firms and, you know, your general run of the mill consultants mm -hmm. is get really clear on who you are, know your why. And then tell your narrative in a way that's as appealing as possible for others. So that I don't, I don't disagree with the know your why part. That, that's just good karma. That's good to know. You have to know how you're wired, um, where your principles lie, what your mission in life is, where do you want to go, what do you want to learn. All those things are really, really important. Can't overstress that enough. If you don't know who you are, people won't want to work with you as much. It doesn't mean that you're imperfect. It just means you're a work in progress. And even the people that know who they are and where they're going and why, that always changes. But not just to go on a tangential path, though. It's extremely difficult to, to figure out what your why is. I mean, I've been in business four and a half years, and I feel like I've had so much clarity just in the last year, more clarity in the mm -hmm. last year than I had the preceding three years. Yeah. So that's a very, very tough, tough thing to accomplish. Well, let, let's go down that for a minute and don't let me forget to come back to the notion of, you know, how do you create your own story? Yeah. So when it comes to your why, um, each of us is a work in progress. And, you know, we start here and hopefully we take a hero's journey path and we get better and better and better over time. The reason it's so continuously challenging is that the world just changes. You know, so the, the challenge about finding out your why is that we all start here, whatever our age of enlightenment is. And over time, we hope we get better, just like in a hero's journey. Harry Potter got better. Ulysses got better. Nancy Drew got better. You know, whatever your storyline is that you like. Um, what, what's so weird about the world is changing so fast is that the people around us are changing. The businesses, the environment, the economic conditions, whatever is, you know, in vogue is changing. And we're constantly responding to it. Each of us in business, especially in professional services, wants to be relevant and paid for being relevant. 
And Absolutely. it's a continuous effort to stay aligned with, you know, what the market needs and what they think of you and who you are and what you think of yourself. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to try to keep that alignment going all the time. So knowing your why is important. And here's the big thing that people forget. A lot of people think that the why is about me. In professional services in particular, that never, ever, ever works. In boxing, it can work because there are a lot of powerful personalities in both senses of the word, and they are the center of their own universes, and that works in boxing because that's what the fans want. That's what keeps them motivated. It's what upsets their opponents and freaks them out. In professional services, when you're serving others, it does not work, period, full stop, mic drop, that's it. What it's about is the outcome of value that you deliver for your customer, your why has to be what you do for other people. Great and point. it has to include three things. It's got to include the value that you create for others. That's number one. And that value has to be something that they measure as valuable. It can't be, oh, I'm going to give 50 hours for the price of one. That's your definition of value. What's the client's definition of value? Sometimes they want, might, might want frictionless service. They might want trustworthy advice. They might want emotional support going through a tough decision. You have to know what that is. The second thing is you have to know who your audience is. And that doesn't mean Mr. Smith or Miss Green. It doesn't mean a president of a Fortune 500 company. It means a little bit more like what situation are they in? What are you persona. great at doing? Persona of buyers. Yeah. Say again? A persona. Essentially. Exactly. You've buyer. got to know the full persona. Perfect. Perfect. And then the third thing you have to know with your why is how your client will be better off once you're done. Yeah. A lot of people don't ask that question. And it's so important to know the end state that you can promise day in and day out with your brand and know that you deliver. That's where your confidence comes from. So if you're a great professional speaker, but you can't train anybody, you can't become a, a speaking coach because you can't get people over that hump of sure. you know, imparting your wisdom to them. Does that make sense? No, I, I think that's an excellent point. And I feel like, you know, the, the self, I want to call it a self-serving mentality has been exacerbated by COVID and we just don't have time. You know, if I receive an email, if I, re if I see a video or a post or anything like that, and it doesn't resonate with me personally, I do not have enough time to investigate further. Ergo, that individual that created that piece will knock in my business. And that's just kind of where we are. And I went through this exercise myself um, and it's all about kind of creating current state, future state, and then the end result. And I totally agree. And what I've tried to fix over the last four years is it's less about me and my firm and more so about, hey, this is somebody else's current situation. And if they work with us, you know, how we could create a better situation collectively. And so I, I, I yeah. totally agree. That totally resonates yeah. with me. And I feel it's, it's, it's not simplistic, but it's just it's, it's overlooked so much and everybody thinks it's all about me 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 and it's really not yeah. people don't give a crap anymore it's really yeah. not when i ask you to think about the most confident people you know aren't those the ones that know where they stand and why and they can be just so wired in and focused on what's going on with you that they appear confident because they are they're not worried about how they're coming across and how they look and what people think of them they already know because they've set their own ground rules They've, they've created their own worldview. And they're, That's confident, why they're the, confident with their why <laughs> and you know, and what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. yeah. And again, for the audience, for everybody listening, this is a, this is a progression thing. You don't just start great at it. You know, if you're a high school football hero, it doesn't mean you know your why. If you're or a Nobel prize winning chemist, it doesn't mean you know your why. Performance and the, your whyness, you know, are often totally disconnected. The more you connect your financial success to your self-esteem, the, the weirder your life is going to be. So they're, they're very different. So let's talk about story structure for a second. Yeah, let's be a little bit more uh, tactical, here, tactical here. Exactly. Yeah. Formulating good story, structure, components, and how does one start? Yeah. So if you're in the business of, uh, let's go back to the scenario that you set up, um, in a, a moderately experienced or you know young in the career, but not novice consultant wants to hang out her own shingle or his own shingle, they get their why down. The next thing they need to do is figure out the occasions of use. Um, that's a marketing term that just means, you know, when are people going to need you? Mm -hmm. And in consulting and professional services, some things are required. 
You know, for example, right now, um, with California privacy law and GDPR and all this stuff, you kind of need a privacy consultant. You just need that. So it's required governmentally, you know, uh, you got to have one. Sure. Some things happen on an occasional basis, like your taxes. You need an accountant to go through your taxes. Unless you're an accounting nerd and you like to read FASB standards. Ugh, not me. Not, not this guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, I lost my train of thought. Where was I? No worries. Uh, formulating a good story, components, um, and how does one start? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So you need to know your, your, um, your use cases, if you will. So you've got to talk to a few clients, whether they've bought from you or not, or whether you don't even know who they are. Nobody else is acceptable. You can't talk to people outside Oh, of your client group to get good advice. Do not go to your gastroenterologist to get good dental advice. It just I'm doesn't are, And I feel like I'm keeping you sidetracked, but this really excites me, this, this whole topic. So I, I did this, made this mistake when I started my company. I was going to be an entrepreneur. I was dead set. It was going to happen. And so who did I talk to? Everybody who had not started a company themselves. You know, <laughs> only people that are in corporate America that had not walked a mile in the shoes that I was about to, to put on. And, yeah. you know, it just, the, the advice was a mismatch. And so yep. since then, I literally never accept advice for people who have not walked a mile in my shoes. There you go. I, I disagree with that. And I agree with that. I'll we'll talk about that later if you yeah. remind me. Okay. So once you've got your occasions of use, um, you can start to figure out what your services are because you can't tell your story without saying what your role in it is or how you're going to help create value. Mm -hmm. So if I were an attorney and I offered to do a risk analysis, interesting, an intellectual property review, a licensing opportunity review, like, hey, you've got all this IP laying around. You could make money on this. You could license that. We could do a deal with this other company for this piece of code you're no longer using. It has nothing to do with litigation or you know, keeping people safe inside the letter of the law. It has to do with creating value. See, those are different services. So once you know the occasions, your why, your occasions of use from talking to people, you start to engineer your services. Then you wanna check in and get real nice tight descriptions from them. And this is where it gets really hard. I've gotten bogged down in what I'm about to say and so have a lot of other people. Sure. It's really hard once you know the answer to remember what it was like to not know the answer. It's like riding a bicycle. You can't get on a bike and go through the experience of learning how to ride again. But every one of your prospects is in that boat. They're asking questions that are very beginner. They're immature. They're not well-founded. They know they have a need. They don't know quite what to ask for. So you've got to go back and find out what it is they're asking for and how they look for it. The first example I heard of this was when the internet was really young and I was reading a digital, running a digital agency called Galileo here in Atlanta back in the 90s. Okay, that's a really long time ago. So um, we were doing this project for Bell South and it had to do with creating a directory. It wasn't for, you know, all the people in the world. It was more for the vendor side of things. And um, somebody gave me this example and I've just never forgotten it. They said, all right. When you have, when you look up in the ceiling and you see little drops of water forming and, and like pinging down to the floor, what do you search for? A bucket. A bucket. A leaky roof. Blah, 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 blah. What right. you need is a plumber right. or a roofer, but nobody knows that because they don't know the discipline yet. So you've got to kind of go back in time and figure out how do you engage in an intelligent, meaningful, connected kind of way without sounding silly or smarmy sure. or full of yourself. That is, in my opinion, the hardest thing to do, because if you're trying to catch new customers, we're not talking about selling by referral or doing speaking right. and stuff like that. But if you're putting the word out for other people to share, you've got to get that beginner message out and make sure they understand the value. So here's the secret to the whole, whole secret sauce is once you know your why, the occasions of use and your services, and you go back and find out what questions are people willing to engage in, you craft your narrative based on an experience this prospect will have in going from 
I need a bucket to my roof is fixed because I hired a plumber. Okay? What are the steps? How do you get involved? Where do you add value? How much time does it take? All the questions that go on in their mind are what you're answering. You're not talking about yourself. You're not talking about how many legal degrees you have or what plumbing school you went to. You're not talking about copper versus PVC piping in the house or the latest regulations from the city planning department. You're talking about the experience that they're going to have with you. And if you can paint a clear picture of that, everybody will know who you are, why you are, what you do, and when to call you and who to refer you. I.e. storytelling. I mean, that, that's the essence of a story, you know, from, from inception, from beginning to end. Um, it is. And it's a story that um, it's not about the past. It's right. a story about what to expect in the future. And that's the big difference that we found at Story Miners in the last few years. There's magic and power in right. telling that story of the future. But for business leaders, even if you're an army of one, you've got to make your business be that story. If that makes sense. You can't just make up the story and then not deliver. You've got to wire your business and all the back end parts to right. deliver the story that you're telling. Otherwise, your credibility just tanks. You got nothing. Totally agree. And you also brought up something earlier that I think is interesting. And, and when I'm having this conversation with consultants, you know, I always say, hey, you know, try to kind of productize your skill set, distill it down to the one, two, three areas in which you can add value versus, you know, keeping it ambiguous. And I'm just a good consultant right? That, that doesn't paint a picture whatsoever. And you need to be prescriptive on what it is that you can do, the problems that you can solve. And again, which I think you've hit on this several times, the future state that the customer will achieve by using your services. So no, I think that's a phenomenal point. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, sure. So the passion, you know, through this discussion is really showing through in regards to storytelling. So let's learn a little bit more about you, Mike. Like, how did you actually get into storytelling? Um, oh, wow. Like, let's yeah. let's the story. What's the backstory? Sure. Well, I had, a, I had a few things in my past that kind of formed the way I think. I was an exchange student to Brazil and the former Soviet Union when I was in high school and college. And learning how to look at people and things going on around you and learning a different language, but also learning the different cultures, customs, rhythms, it forced me to be able to stand in somebody else's shoes and really appreciate what was going on. I learned that two people can be in the same place at the same time, having the same experience and both walk away or each walk away with a completely different understanding of what happened. And when I realized that I wasn't right and they were wrong, but that we were both right, changed my world forever. That ability, that worldview, that ability to change perspectives is so important to being a sensitive, a caring and a good storyteller. Um, my uncle Sam and my first job at his travel agency in Derby, Connecticut, was a masterful guy. He started off as a vaudeville producer. His wife was a singer. And it was uh, I heard some amazing stories about how you'd produce shows back then. Sure. But when he got into the real estate insurance and travel business, he collected things from all of his travels and he put them into the travel agency. So you walk in the front door and there's a wing of an airplane, which is the front counter. And over here is a little French, I don't know what the word for it is, like a, a place where you get pastries and little things like that, you know, like fancy wire chairs and a little yeah. table and stuff like that. And over here was a Swiss chalet. And his office was the inside of a ship's captain's stateroom with leather tooled walls and, a, you know, whatever that thing is that you drive a ship with. So you, you like walked into his business and the whole thing was an experience and it gave people that feeling of I'm already on vacation. So when they talk to you about like, where do you want to go? He would just go, where would you like to go? You know, you can, you can do inside, outside, sunny, yeah. skis, active, quiet, you know, and it helped them to decide because they can imagine that they were on vacation. So fast forward to like um, 20 well, 2002, when we started Story Miners, I was um, working with a colleague of mine named Tom Milkovic, and we were just kind of like talking about how hard it was in the marketplace. We were both struggling to, you know, what to do. I had just left IBM as their e-visionary, and life was hard, and the market was weird, and the bubble had just popped. And we both realized that we were really good at eking out the brand story. You know, what is this person about? What is this leader about? What is this brand about? What can this product really do? And we kind of looked at each other and the name Story Miners came out. And I thought it was kind of a clever name, but I had no idea it was going to take me on this journey of actually becoming a storyteller. People started assuming 
that I was good at stories in like year two, but I wasn't. There were so many other people that could tell a better story than I could. But I started leaning into it. I started reading and paid more attention. I read Robert McGee's story. I read a bunch of other things, re-familiarized myself with some classics. I read anime, comic books, um, history, biographies, all kinds of things to try to kind of sort out how does somebody like in the first few words grab your attention? Right. And I learned a lot about neuroscience and brain chemistry. I don't know a lot, but I know enough to know that, you know, we are all addicts to the chemistry in our brains. So. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then we got, we were asked to do some story assignments and I bumbled through the first couple of them. And then I stumbled on this idea of you can tell a story that tells people what to do, or you can tell a story where they figure out what to do where they're the hero. Now that's a long so standing. The is, is a heck of a lot more effective than the former, right? Yeah, and I was not the guy to figure that out. You know, there's so many people ahead of time know that hero's journey arc. Joseph Campbell brought it to I, light book, for a lot of people. It's actually on my desk, the hero's journey. So I'm, I'm not gonna oh, wonderful. bore you cool. find it, but uh, yeah, keep going, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so over the years, um, I just started making story more and more a part of what we do. So we introduced this concept called future story, another one called human prototyping, which is about acting out the customer experience of the future. We've done retail and healthcare designs, you know, like two or three generations ahead of where a business is right now. And it's all based on the idea of what's the story that you want to tell. We even trademark the tagline, find your story, be your story. Cause that is like, that's it. Once you find where you want to go and what your calling is, you need to become that. And I think we did that because that's what happened to me. I found my story and then over time actually became that. No, I think that's excellent. I love the, the tagline, find your story, be your story. And, you know, I feel like I'm going through that real time, to be honest with you, on my yeah. own journey in this four and a half years. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's fascinating. I appreciate you sharing the background. Um, so a couple of follow-up questions. So storytelling, right? So is it only effective for, people trying to sell a product, a service for companies, for independent consultants, or are there other applications? Like how can people leverage yeah, there, in there, their there mi life more effectively? Millions of applications. Um, probably the oldest one is um, passing knowledge down to preserve, you know, the clan or the tribe or the group, you know, um, red things will kill you. Green things are okay to eat, you know, um, watch out for this big animal. This one, you know, is friendly. Um, it's used for uh, teaching. Um, stories are used for entertainment. Mm -hmm. Stories are used to um, encourage people to change their behavior, to motivate. Coaches tell stories lots of time. Uh, coaches in football and basketball and sports and coaches in business and life and your personal world. Um, we hear a lot of stories um, in advertisements as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very nervous about where advertising is going right now because the, the, the separation between what a brand promises and what the business delivers is really spreading apart. Yes. So often you can almost imagine that whatever a company claims is not true. Well, it's like 5G, what, is, what, is, what does that even mean? You know, <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> yeah. But no, that, 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 that's helpful. And it's, it's funny when you, when, you, when you mentioned that about, you know, passing down for generations um, in the different applications for storytelling, it feels that I actually utilize stories a lot more than I ever envisioned I did or thought I did. Mm -hmm. um, however, I think the area in which I could utilize them more is my business. And again, not, not trying to bring this back to business, but I think that's really the area which me personally, I'm deficient for, you know, in using the art of the storytelling in my day to day. Um, and I need to do a much better job of incorporating do, that. Do you want to want to role play something and, and play it out? Um, may, maybe offline, maybe offline. I would, okay. All right. I, I appreciate the offer there. Um, sure. So just a couple more questions. So if you were to, to do an engagement with a business, right? So we talked about independent consultants, you know, what would that typically look like from beginning, middle and end? Well, one of the things I've learned is to not bring my process in with such as heavy hand that people have to bend their will and their way to how I work. I, I personalize. I've, I've been around long enough that I can work in different ways. I can speak in different languages. I can work with different personalities. Why would I bring a heavy consulting methodology to the table? Generally speaking, though, people are looking to uncover some truths at the beginning of an engagement. There are things that they don't know. Sometimes that means speaking truth to power and saying, you know, boss, 
this idea that you have around X, Y, Z, it sucks. Sorry, but it yeah. sucks. And we have to work on that because it's a roadblock for all these other things. So let me, let me answer your question directly though. Sorry. Um, typically it starts off with a conversation. It's a go anywhere, ask anything, discover as much as we can kind of a thing. If it's a larger business, I'll go shop the business. I'll go shop for furniture. I'll go to the dentist. I'll, you know, call a, a shipping supplier and negotiate some rates, whatever it is. And I take note of how the business is coming across and how it makes me feel, because that's the end game for a story. Right. People when, with limited information, we're, as humans, we're very good at filling in all the gaps and making assumptions about whether something is good or not for us. So I'll get that experience. Then we go back in and talk about where does the company want to go? How does it want to get there? What are the constraints that they see? I'll interview customers, also employees. We'll do some workshops to try to figure out what are the services, um, uh, any big changes that we're trying to introduce. Are there any capabilities lacking? And one that's goes into almost every business is something around innovation. People need to be better at innovating. And it doesn't just mean coming up with new ideas. It means having a way to talk about new ideas separately from the way the business is running day to day. And it also means knowing what stage an idea is at and how much resource is going to it and kind of, um, can't think of the word, um, destigmatizing you know, a new idea or acceptance of an idea. So if somebody has an idea, and it fails, they shouldn't be seen as a lower caste than somebody who has an idea and it works. You know, getting rid of that is important because all ideas have the same value at the start. It's only the ones that actually get implemented sure. that matter. But also too, you want to work put your, your business in a position where you're empowering people to bring ideas to the table. Right? Bingo, is, you get it, so absolutely, yeah. That there is such thing as a bad idea and, and from where I come from, there's not. Right. I mean, any idea is a good idea. We just won't be able to, to put, you know, all of them into play. Yeah. Over time, I'm going to take us a side note on that. Over time, um, companies will also develop some principles. And um, rather than processes, which can kind of get very dated, principles actually get stronger over time. So in medicine, one of the most important principles is the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. Right. That you never want your patient to be worse off you know, after they've seen you. So for a business, it's not um, every idea will be treated equally or every idea is good. It's that every idea that meets our criteria for honoring customers, protecting the environment, making a profit where possible, you know, those kinds, of, if, you, if you put it in that order, any idea is going to have to go through that filter and you're going to end up with a whole bunch of things like Patagonia has, They've had some amazing ideas that they've never done, and they have some revolving, um, involving recycling and circular economy that much larger brands like Nike and Adidas, or Adidas, however you say it, um, have picked up on. So they've had a huger impact on the planet than a company of their size possibly could, and they've rooted it all in principles. So um, I just wanted to bring that up because it's not as black and white as, you know, ideas are good or bad. It's ideas that, that kind of fit where that company is going and where it's trying to create value. I just wanted to bring back that, that core notion. No, I think, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, sincerely. So I appreciate you sharing that. So a couple more questions and we'll get you out of here. But we talked about advice earlier. And I mentioned how, you know, when I first started my company, I took advice from all the wrong people. And now I'm kind uh -huh. of down this, this path. And I, and I generally only take advice from people who've walked a mile in my shoes. And you said you have, a, you have a strong opinion in that. So I just wanted to circle back and kind of get your perspective on advice. Um, sure. and, you know, who, who are, the, who are the, the right people to get advice from and who are not? All right, perfect. Um, so I'm glad you brought that back up. Thank you very much. Um, if you restrict whom you get opinions and ideas from mm -hmm. in any way, you're going to create bias in your own thinking. Sure. If you only listen to green people or short people or people with, you know, blonde hair, you're not going to get a full circle understanding of what's going on. So the, I, I love the idea uh, when you're looking at prospects and you're building your business for your clients, talking to more clients. It doesn't mean that your, you know, your girlfriend's manicurist's dog groomer might not have a good idea, but you have to decide where you're going to spend your time. 
So here, um, when it comes to your storytelling, there's something that I'd like to suggest to everybody to at least try one time. And that's to ask other people who've worked with you, regardless of whether they were a client, mm -hmm. a teacher, a student, a colleague, uh, a tennis player, whatever the deal is, ask them how they would describe you to somebody else. Ask them why you're fun to work with or why you're competent or I think a lot of people wouldn't you... want to know the answers to those questions, Mike. Say again? So I think a lot of people wouldn't want to hear the answers to those, that question. Well, it, you know, it is a moment of truth, but yeah. that's where the real words come from because it's so hard. It was hard for me to right. describe myself using how I thought about myself. Mm -hmm. Remember we talked before about the plumber and the leaky roof, yeah. right? it's the same mental challenge. You can't see yourself from the outside because you're inside of yourself. So asking people how to pitch you, how to describe you, those words often relate so much better to the brand new prospect than anything else. And what you do when you start there with other people's words is you create an experience for them to learn who you are and what it might be like to work with you. And that's the journey that every story should tell. So excellent point. I went through this recently with my business and, you know, did some, some customer discovery, probably the wrong word, but basically, you know, sat down, well, it wasn't me, it was a third party, sat down with customers and really got an understanding what it was like to work with me and my firm. Um, yeah. And it really, um, A, it was encouraging, which is always good, but B, it really helped us kind of, you know, feather out the why, the what, and the, the future state, um, mm -hmm. which then kind of tied back into the messaging that we have on the website on what you will experience if you work with us. And it's so powerful. I've never done it. It was four and a half years that I've been in business, and I'm just now kind of getting to the point where I'm soliciting feedback in order to kind of, you know, capture that and put it on my website. And it's super powerful because it, it, it really cuts through all the crap and gets to, hey, this is what you're going to get if you work with these guys. And um, yeah. I think if anybody awesome. takes, you know, a, a key point from this, this discussion, it's, it's that. Mm -hmm. so, Perfect. What, what, what a nice bow to put on the package today. I appreciate you sharing. Um, any other tidbits, uh, thoughts, or otherwise that somebody should consider when trying to kind of feather out or uncover their personal story or their, their personal brand? You know, don't, don't let it get too much under your skin. <laughs> It, it can drive you nutty trying to figure something out like that when you're in a process of becoming. It's hard. I mean, I feel it too. So just be nice to yourself. Be easy. You know, take it in steps. Realize it's a marathon that never right. ends. You know, Mar marketing is like a sprint without a goal. I've heard it said. And um, this kind of work will always be evolutionary. So the most important thing you can do in the beginning is to open your mind and practice keeping it open. But you also have to be kind of calm and centered as you go about it. Otherwise, you'll drive yourself nuts and you'll spend too much on psychiatry. <laughs> I've, I've been there where it's like, you know, I'm ready to get to this future state now. And to your point, it's continuously iterating, always. Yeah. And I finally embrace that I will never be 100% perfect. You'll just get incrementally better the more you focus on it. Um, one last question. You hear about authenticity all the time. Mm -hmm. what, what is your opinion on authenticity and a personal story and branding and, and putting that authenticity out into the marketplace? That's a huge question. It's another podcast, but okay. let me, um, let me give a, an example here in the way of story. So one of the most authentic ways for people to know who you are and what you can do is to set somebody else up to tell the story. Let me give you an example. Okay. Three-part example. Ask me how great I am. Mike, how great are you? Damn, I am awesome. <laughs> how, do, how do you read that? Um, totally self-serving and BS. Um, I think that's enough. Okay, so ask me again. Hey, Mike, how awesome are you? I'm, I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> you know, when you get to work with me, you'll find that out. Sure. How do you read that? Uh, a little bit more genuine, a little bit more authentic, but um, still missing the mark. Yep. So last time. Mike, how awesome are you? Well, I don't know, but the last few clients that I've worked with, they all resonated on the notion that when they started working with me, they thought it was going to be hard. And they found out that it was really a lot easier than they expected. And the results they achieved were better than they thought. I can give you some referrals if you like. 
I was hoping you were going to close with the referral piece. No, that's yeah. <laughs> excellent. That's how, do, how do you read that one? No, much more authentic. And it's not about you. It's about, again, the, the, the story and the outcome um, and, and the, the, ultimately the, the picture you're trying to paint. Here, here's the takeaway. And the social proof with, with the referral is great. Yeah. Well, what I did is I introduced new characters in the story and they spoke for me. And I said, a few of my clients resonated on the same point. That means it's probably true. Yeah. No, and I, it, yeah. Love that. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Authenticity and practice. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. So lastly, how can someone get in touch with you? We'll, we'll put it on the, um, on the video, but, but where's the best place to reach Mike? Wonderful. Um, just send me an email, Mike at storyminers.com. S-T-O-R-Y-M-I-N-E-R-S.com. Monitor it all the time. Um, storyminers.com. You can also just Google Mike Wittenstein and put the spelling up there. Um, there's, an, there's a guy who sells shoes in Texas. That's not him. I'm not him. Um, I'm the customer experience strategy story brand guy. Awesome. Well, hey, Mike, greatly appreciate you joining. Sincerely, this was fantastic. I love the topic. Love what you're doing. Um, greatly appreciate you coming on the podcast. Wonderful. And this is a pleasure for me too. Great questions. And I'm glad you're going through some of the same things your audience is. It's awesome that you're doing this. Thank you, sir. I'll be seeking your counsel very soon, I assure you. So thank you. Cheers. Cheers.